Let's open our Bibles to Revelation chapter 3 this evening as we continue on in the study of the letter of Jesus Christ to the church of Philadelphia. Revelation chapter 3. Well, those are some good and challenging songs tonight, and filled with hope and God's love, and looking forward to the day that we will be there with Him. Until then, we will carry on, we will be the light God has called us to be, we will do what He wants us to do in His power and His strength. Uh, He never grows weary, even though we do. Uh, But when we wait upon the Lord, we will gain new strength in Him. May our hearts be encouraged in those thoughts. Let's bow in prayer uh, before we begin tonight. Father, we thank You for this evening and what a joy it has been to sing these hymns before you, to praise you, and also our hearts are filled with singing of your love and thinking of the day that we will be with you. Father, we praise you for your faithfulness to us every single day. We thank you, Father, that you have made an immeasurable provision for us in Your Son beyond our understanding, Your love toward us, Father. In giving Your only Son, we thank You for His coming to earth, though tested there in the garden severely. He carried out Your will. And we praise You and thank You for His example in every way in His life here as a man. And I pray that as we as a church and corporately and individually grow in conformity to the image of our Savior Jesus Christ as we grow in having the mind of Christ, that, Father, we too would be the people you've called us to be before the world that is hopelessly and helplessly lost in and of their selves without the good news of Jesus Christ. Father, they have no hope. Thank you that we have the light. May we be bold. May we be zealous and not callous of heart, willing to let people die around us and not share the good news of Jesus Christ with them. Father, I pray that You'd work a mighty work in this church that we might have the zeal that You have for the lost. We know that will never be to that degree, but Father that we would have much more zeal for the lost as we go out and proclaim the truth and let our light shine. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Revelation chapter 3, we are in the church of Philadelphia. And Philadelphia is a church that was not rebuked. Their condemnation was that you have little strength, But you've kept my word and you have not denied my name. What a wonderful commendation. And the fact that they had little strength meant that their strength was coming from where? From the Almighty God. And their dependence was on Him and their dependence was not upon themselves in any way. They were not able, but God was. And what an encouragement that is to me. And I trust it's an encouragement to you. That we we don't have to look inwardly and say, what can I do? What do I know? How can I serve the Lord? 
How can I be a light? Look at me. Instead of looking at ourselves, looking to Jesus Christ, our Savior, looking to the Almighty God, who can give us every bit of strength we need and give us every bit of wisdom we need at any moment, at any time, when He's called us to do any certain task He's called us to do. It's kind of like that song that we just sang, that we ended with. We have to say, Here I am, Lord. Here I am. I'm nothing, but here I am. Use me, Lord, to Your honor and glory, according to Your wisdom and strength. And I believe that's kind of how the church of Philadelphia was. And that's how we ought to be ourselves. Now, we are in the promise in verse 10. And so we will begin reading tonight in verse 10 and read down to the end of the letter in verse 13. Jesus says to the church of Philadelphia, Because you have kept my command to persevere, I also will keep you from the hour of trial which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. Behold, I am coming quickly. Hold fast what you have, that no one may take your crown. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go out no more. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God. And I will write on him my new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So we see here, as we begin this evening, we have this promise in verse 10 to the church of Philadelphia. And as I said last week, by extension, this is a promise to all of us. This is a promise to every church throughout the generations and however long the Lord tarries to every church until He comes back for His bride. And this is a promise to us that He will keep us from the hour of trial, which is going to come upon the whole world with a purpose that is going to test those who dwell on the earth. All right, a little review here quickly. Uh, the hour of trial we saw to be what period yet to come? The tribulation. All right, I will keep you from the tribulation, which shall come upon the whole world to test. Notice the purpose is to test a certain group of people, those who dwell on the earth. Now, who recalls what, it, what we saw in the book of Revelation? Those who dwell on the earth are what class of people? Unbelievers. Just to review just that one point. Let's go to Revelation 17, 8. And this was a slam dunk verse. But every one of these passages, except Revelation 3, 10, pointed, to the, pointed in the direction that these are unbelievers he's talking about. The exact same words are used one, two, three, four, five, six times in this book. And this is the last time it's used. 17, Revelation 17, 8. The beast that you saw was and is not and will ascend out of the bottomless pit and go to perdition. And those who dwell on the earth will marvel, whose names 
are not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world when they see the beast that was and is not and yet is. And so, going back now to Revelation 3, uh, 10, we see, uh, and I can advance this slide. Uh, first of all, we'll just go back to a uh, quick review. Christ makes it very clear that He is delivering the church from rather than through the period of tribulation. That word means out from. So it, it means literally as we know it, we match other Scripture with it. We are going to be taken off the earth during the hour of trial. Now the hour of trial, those who dwell on the earth, we saw that. Uh, the hour of trial is a reference to the church being kept from the tribulation. The tribulation is described in Revelation 6 through Revelation 19, and you won't see any mention of the church in that area when it's called uh, the, the tribulation, um, because they we will be in heaven. Last week we looked at all of these passages. Uh, just as a review... Let's look at one, First Thessalonians chapter 5. And we'll use this as another reference point in a minute. So we'll go to Revelation chapter 5 where it promises that we will be kept from the wrath to come. We are not going to be a part of Daniel's 70th week. We are not going to be a part of the time of Jacob's trouble. We are not going to be part of the tribulation here on earth that is going to test unbelievers. Now, the key verse is 9, but let's go back to verse 2. Well, verse 1, But concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord, just mark that for a moment in your mind, the day of the Lord, you know perfectly well, perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. For when they, and I emphasize they, because Paul is not including himself in this group of people. For when they say, peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. But you, brethren, ah, notice now, but you, brethren, are not in darkness like the former group he was just talking about. You are not in darkness so that this day should overtake you as a thief. You are all sons of light and sons of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Jump down to verse 8. But let us, Paul is including himself, but let us who are of the day be sober putting on the breastplate of faith and love and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with Him. Therefore, comfort each other and edify one another, just as you also are doing. The encouragement, the edification was, and the comfort was, you are not going through the tribulations. You are going to be spared from the wrath that is going to come upon the whole earth and test those who dwell on the earth, unbelievers, to test unbelievers. It would be ludicrous for the church to be going through the tribulation. So this is the main point that we want to take away from this promise 
uh, to the church. Now, looking at a timeline, tell me, we'll do it the old-fashioned way. Looking at the timeline, we saw this briefly, I believe, last week. The hour of trial in the middle, in yellow, is pointing to the seven-year period of tribulation. Just so you have in your mind, if you back up to the left, you see where we are today, the church. The very next event, which is imminent, and we're going to talk about this in just a minute, is the arrow pointing up to the cloud where Christ, where we, the church, the bride of Christ, are going to meet the Lord in the air, in the clouds, it says. All right, so the other, I'm going to do it this way. I don't know what happened to this. We have to remember to put batteries in this before tomorrow morning. The other is, and I told you to mark in your mind the day of the Lord, there are the two yellow lines going up to the main uh, horizontal line are that represents the day of the Lord. It is 1,000, seven years. That's a seven-year tribulation and a 1,000-year millennial reign of Christ. So the day of the Lord is not all bad. And it refers to sometimes blessing and the kingdom, but it also refers to the beginning of the day of the Lord, the tribulation. All right, so there you see uh, a little bit of a timeline. Now, the the period of tribulation is called the time of Jacob's trouble. We're not going to turn to Jeremiah 30 tonight because we did last week. And verse 7 we saw that it, there it's called, this period of tribulation is called the time of Jacob's trouble. To me, that has significance. We're going to talk about that in a few minutes. Um, this is a period of time. What is the tribulation? What is God's purpose for the tribulation? Why is this going to happen? Well, if we read Jeremiah 30, once again, it reveals... God's wrath will be poured out on Israel because of their iniquity, as well as all of the nations that spurned Israel and who have rejected Christ. His wrath will likewise be poured out on the Gentiles as well. Now, concerning this period of Jacob's trouble, this period of tribulation, Let's turn to the next to the last book in the Old Testament, Zechariah 13. Zechariah chapter 13. And again, this is going to get to the heart of the issue of what is God doing in this tribulation? Well, what did we already learn from Revelation 3.10? What is the purpose of of the hour of trial or the hour of testing to test those who dwell upon the earth. Now notice the parallel here with the concept of being tested here as we look at the tribulation from Zechariah, the prophet Zechariah. Let's begin in verse 7. Awake, O sword, against my shepherd, against the man who is my companion. Say, says the Lord of hosts, strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. Then I will turn my hand against the little ones. All right, verse 7 is talking about referencing the prophecy of the crucifixion of Christ. And then he says, but then I will turn my hand against the little ones, referring to Israel. And it shall come to pass, verse 8, and it shall come to pass in all the land, says the Lord, that two-thirds in it shall be cut off and die, but one-third shall be left in it. And I will bring the one-third through the fire, will refine them as silver is refined and test them as gold is tested. 
They will call upon my name and I will answer them. I will say, this is my people. And each one, the one third, will say, the Lord is my God. So what's going to happen? This is specifically referring to Israel. And it's referring to the time of tribulation. And it says that he's going to test all of those who dwell on the earth. Two-thirds are going to do what? They're going to shake their fist at God. And they're going to say, I reject you. I reject your son, Jesus Christ. He is not the Messiah. And however they reject him, two-thirds will reject him. But one-third will be refined to the point that they humble their hearts and they will say, the Lord is my God. And God will say, these are my people. Now, if you're familiar with the New Covenant, uh, this is, I believe, again, this is parallel to the New Covenant. The time when the New Covenant will be instituted so let's go to Jeremiah 31, when God's people will say, this is my God. And God will say, these are my people. So what I'm saying is Zechariah 13, the verses we just read, when that one-third rises up and says, this is my God, this is the time the new covenant will be instituted. Behold the day, verse 30, Jeremiah 31, 31. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the, in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke. And what covenant is he talking about here? The Mosaic covenant. When he brought them out of Egypt. My covenant which they broke. Though I was a husband to them. Says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days. Says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds. And write it on their hearts. And I will be their God. And they shall be my people, no more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they all shall know me. From the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. There were days when I would read Jeremiah 31 in years gone by and I would kind of cringe in my soul because I couldn't explain how this day would come. I couldn't really explain how the, the Lord says, I will write my law in their minds and I will write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they shall be my people. I felt as though God was going to take this new covenant and cram it down their throats, whether they wanted it or not as a nation. But now as I compare more of the Old Testament, especially like Zechariah. When Zechariah makes that prophecy, you have to remember this. They have been literally, not literally, they have been essentially through hell. The worst time that mankind, the, the worst suffering that man has ever, ever seen on the face of the earth. This one-third of Israel is going to humble their hearts and boy, are they going to bow down before Him and they're going to say, this is my God. And He's going to say, these are my people. But what have they been through? What have they been through for seven years, especially the last three and a half years? They have been tested, but they passed the test. They accepted the Messiah as their Savior. And every one of them, every single one that survives, that one-third that survives of Israel, 
are all going to know, this is my God. This is my Savior. And so, in my mind anyway, that, that brings a comfort understanding about concerning this new covenant uh, that these people are wilf- willfully going to accept Jesus, their Messiah, as their Savior. Now, one more. Whoops, I didn't, I didn't do this. There was the one. There's the other. And now the last one. God is dealing in the tribula, in the period of tribulation. God is dealing with unbelieving Jew and Gentiles during this period of time. The church is not in view. There are, they are in heaven. The church has been raptured before the tribulation begins. And then we come back down at the end of the tribulation, at the end of the seven year period, we come back down with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, and we will be right there with Him at the Battle of Armageddon. Let's turn to, just to be excited about this, let's turn to Revelation chapter 19, and I can't really read this enough. The encouragement is tremendous. We will begin in verse 7. And you will definitely see that the bride of Christ is in heaven. You will note that the bride of Christ is in heaven. You will also note that the bride will come down with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords when He comes in the second advent. So let's read together Revelation 19, verse 7. Let us be glad and rejoice and give Him glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and His wife has made herself ready. And to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Then he said to me, to John, then he said to me, Write, Blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are the true sayings of God. And I fell at his feet to worship him. But he said to me, See that you do not do that. I am your fellow servant and of your brethren who have the testimony of Jesus Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Then, now, I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on him is, was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness, he ma- in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except him. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, And with it he should strike the nations. And he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And if you, and if we continued on the Armageddon, the Battle of Armageddon, Really, in verse 19, And I saw the beast, the armies of the earth, and their armies, the kings of the earth, and their armies, gathered together to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. That would be us. So there, and you could read 20 and 21, but essentially um, he cast the, the false prophet, and the Antichrist into the lake of fire alive, 
and then with the sword of his mouth he he kills the entire all the kings and all the armies assembled with the kings there on the earth and the birds were filled with their flesh so uh, this just adds to the case that I'm trying to build that we will not be going through the tribulation. Now, this is called, if I'm looking in my notes, this eschatological view is called pre-tribulationism or pre-tribulationalism. Either way, uh, I've seen it both ways. This is an eschatological view. Uh, these are the two, well, following are the two main views held by theologians concerning the rapture of the church. Pre-tribulationism -trib, pre means that the church will be raptured pre-trib, before the tribulation here on earth. Post-tribulationalism, there are theologians who believe that the church is going to go through the rapture, uh, go, is going to go through the tribulation and be raptured after. So what you have by their theology is, according to their eschatological view, the church will go through the tribulation. They will then, at the end of the tribulation, be raptured up, meet the Lord in the air. I don't know if they ever get us all the way to heaven in the verses we just read, but then we come right back down with Christ to the earth as described. Uh, it doesn't, for me, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't fit well together for many different reasons and there's a lot, there's a lot of good argumentation against post-tribulationalism, but that's not my purpose tonight. My purpose is to try and show you that I believe uh, that uh, our eschatological view, my eschatological view is uh, pre-tribulationism, that we are going to be raptured before the tribulation here on earth to test those who dwell on the earth. And I'm not one of that group. All right, so let's go through five primary supports for pre-trib, for the pre-trib rapture. I referenced two, you could reference a lot of materials. I just referenced Steve Waterhouse's one Volume Systematic Theology, which I, by the way, highly recommend. He's not a theologian. Uh, we, many of you have met Stephen Waterhouse, having spoken here at our conference. He's not a theologian that goes on and on and on and on. He he makes a simple point, and then he then he then he drops a truckload of verses on you, and says, "You make up your mind if this statement I just made is true." And that's the way I like. Uh, and that's why he fits it all in one volume as well. The other, the other uh, reference was Arnold Fruchtenbaum, his Footsteps of the Messiah, a study of the sequence of prophetic events. So these are the two references I used, uh, and I just uh, put, a, put a lot together myself as well. Um, so here we go. Uh, let's let's delve into it. Number one, and if you ever want to, I, I recommend. And if you ever want my notes, I'll, I'll send them to you. But if you ever want to nail this down, I guarantee you, when you walk out of here tonight, you may not be convinced. And if somebody stopped you in a parking lot and said, "Prove pre-tribulationalism to me," you you might not be ready to do it. You have to come to this on your own. I'm not trying to cram anything down your throat. I'm trying to give you scripture that you can be uh, convinced, I trust by scripture, that the church is not going to go through the tribulation, that we will be raptured before the tribulation. So number one is a very strong argument. The rapture is imminent. This means that the rapture is an impending event that need not wait for any intervening events. Imminent does not mean quickly, as some have construed it 
to mean. Imminent means there's nothing in the way of the rapture taking place tonight. It could take place right now. There's no other eschatological event that must take place before it. Like, for instance, the tribulation. If you're post-trib, then what has to happen before the rapture of the church? We have to go through the tribulation. Or those alive, the church that is alive at that time, be it a hundred years from now, wouldn't be any of us in the church at that time if it's a hundred years from now. But they would have, at some point, the church has to go through the tribulation before they're raptured. That fits to fit the post-tribulational view. All right, the rapture is imminent. We are commanded to wait for the Lord's return with eager anticipation. There are a number of verses that talk about us eagerly anticipating the Lord's return. How could this be a, real, a realistic command if we're not going to be raptured until after the tribulation? Where is the blessed hope in this? A majority of the church would be slaughtered during the tribulation before the rapture. So let's take the imminent return of Christ for His bride and let's look these up. Let's go to Romans 13.11. I trust if you're if you're a serious student about grasping these doctrines that I think are essential for the encouragement of the church, I trust that you're at least writing down all the verses uh, since we started this last week, and you're able to have a collection of them together somewhere and be able to go through them on your own. Revelation 13.11 and do this knowing the time that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Therefore let us cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. And so there was an anticipation. And notice Paul includes himself we, for now our deliverance is nearer than when we first believed. Now, these have to be taken together collectively. One, one passage may not stand alone well enough to suit you, but collectively they paint a, a great picture. 1 Corinthians 1.7 Oh, we have to start in verse 4. I thank my God always concerning you for the grace of God which was given to you by Christ Jesus, that you were enriched in everything by Him, in all the utterance and all knowledge, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, so that you come short in no gift, eagerly waiting for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, either Paul's an idiot, crazy, or whatever you might want to label him, where if he's writing to this church in Corinth and he is encouraging them in their eager anticipation, waiting for the revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ. 1551, 1 Corinthians. 15.51 And I love when you have the we's in here because even the Apostle Paul was anticipating, he was also eagerly awaiting the revelation of Jesus Christ in his lifetime. Alright, um, verse 51 Behold, I tell you a mystery, we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. 
Let's stop right there. What's he talking about here? We shall not all sleep. He's saying, we shall not all die. But some of us will be alive. But we all will be changed. Meaning we all will receive our resurrection body at the rapture of the church. But we, we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So here we see, this is primarily talking about uh, that we, and the trump, the last trumpet is referring to the last trumpet of this age. And this is the same trumpet that's going to be blowing in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 when the voice of the archangel sounds for the church to come up to meet the Lord in the air. Uh, Pastor Jay used to say, do you know how fast, you know how fast the twinkling of an eye is? This is the speed of the twinkling of an eye. It is the time when the stoplight turns from red to green and the guy behind you beeps a horn. That's the twinkling of an eye. <clears throat> All right, let's go on now. Uh, 1622. If anyone does not love the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be accursed. O Lord, come. Philippians 3.20 For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body that it may be conformed to His glorious body according to the working by which He is able even to subdue all things to Himself. I believe that when the trumpet blows and the voice of the archangel sounds and the dead in Christ rise first and then we who are alive and remain are caught up together to meet the Lord in the air, by the time we get to the Lord, we will have our resurrected bodies. That which is corruptible will put on incorruption. That which is mortal will put on immortality in that period of time, instantaneously. When we meet the Lord, 1 John 3, 1 John 3, 1 or 2 says, And when we see Him, we will be like Him. So by the time we get up to meet Him in the air, we will, we will have our resurrection bodies. 1 Thessalonians uh, 1.10, we might as well go there. Uh, we did look at that one last week. Uh, we'll start in, in verse 9. <clears throat> People in the surrounding area, for they themselves declare concerning us what manner of entry we had to you and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for His Son from heaven whom He raised from the dead, even Jesus who delivers us from the wrath to come. There's a beautiful picture, I believe. He, we are waiting for our Savior who's going to come and deliver us before the wrath comes upon the earth to test those who dwell upon the earth. 1 Thessalonians 4.17 Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort 
one another with these words. But concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you, for you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night, and so on. We just read that. So he goes right from the encouragement of the rapture and encourage one another with these words, and he goes right into again explaining this, that you know the seasons and you have no need that I should write and have to tell you this again, but here I go, I'm going to tell you again, you're not going through the tribulation. You're not of that class of people who are going through the tribulation. You are not of the night, you are of the day. All right. Titus 2.13 Keep in mind, this teaching, pointing to the fact that the rapture is imminent. It could happen. There's nothing that has to happen before the rapture. Verse 11, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all, all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Could you, in all sincerity, read that verse if you thought that we had to go through the tribulation first before? Would it really be the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior? I don't believe it would be the same. James 5.8 James exhorts the saints, You also be patient. Establish your hearts for the coming of of the Lord is at hand. What does that mean? It's at hand. If if any of us in this room said, such and such an event is at hand, you would take that as, it's it's right here. It's ready to happen. And so, it is. It's imminent. All right. Revelation 22.10. And he said to me, Do not seal the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. In chronologically, in the book of Revelation, the tribulation is over. The kingdom is over. And we are looking at the eternal state and so here, he's re- talking, uh, ba- referring back to John, and he says, Do not seal the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. And look at verse 20. He who testifies to these things says, Surely I am coming quickly. Amen. And then John says, Even so come, Lord Jesus. Jesus Himself says, I am coming quickly. The one who testifies of this revelation, I am coming quickly. All right. That is, and, well, boy, we're already out of time. Um, We have four more uh, primary supports for pre-tribulation rapture and then some secondary supports which um, we will go through next week so as not to be too late tonight. All right. What is the purpose of laboring this point? First of all, it's in Scripture, Revelation 3.10. 
He promises the church of Philadelphia, I will keep you from the hour of trial that's going to come upon the whole earth and test those who dwell on the earth. So this is part of our blessed hope. And this is part of our encouragement as a church. We may really, you know, in the next ten years, we may suffer like we have never seen suffering before. And today, you know, oh, this is really kind of exciting. Yeah, the Lord's coming back and so forth. But wait until about a dozen of us are thrown in prison. Wait until some become martyrs. Wait until you are personally suffering as a Christian. Standing up and not denying the name of Christ like the church of Philadelphia already did. Oh, and then when the Lord says, I am going to spare you, I'm going to keep you, I'm going to take you to heaven to be with me so you're not going to be on this earth during the hour of trial, we're going to say, praise the Lord. It's going to mean a whole lot more to us. And I never, I'll never, i never forget what John White said one time, and probably many of you remember what he said. And he wasn't slamming us in one sense. But he says, you know what? He says, heaven means a whole lot more to the gimme people than it means to you. Why? Because really, we're living pretty cush. Pretty good. Life is good compared to the way those tribal people live. Every day is a grind, and I mean a grind. And people are suffering in other parts of the world. Heaven means a whole lot more to them. And when we begin to suffer for Jesus Christ, then this is going to mean a whole lot more to us. But I trust that we can at least see that and know that and understand that. And may our hearts be encouraged to know whose hands we rest in. Let's pray. Father, thank You that You are the Almighty, Sovereign, Omnipotent, Omniscient One. Thank You, Father, that the times are in Your hands. And we thank You that we, the church, are in Your hands. We rejoice and are thankful that we will not go through the tribulation or whatever part of the church is alive at that time. We are thankful tonight to know that whether we're raptured before, uh, whether we're ra whether we pass away before the church is raptured. And Father, I pray that regardless of when our Savior is coming back to take us home, be it tonight or next week or next year or a long time from now. I pray that we would be faithful to be the church You've called us to be. I pray that we would be, uh, Father, greatly encouraged. Again, knowing all is in Your hands, including ourselves. So we thank You for these promises that we have in Scripture that we can hold on to and excite our hearts, uh, Father. And we do long for and look forward to the day when You will call us home. We thank You for the time now of fellowship together. We thank You for the food that has been provided and those that, who have provided it for us. And pray our time would be sweet and centered around You. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.